Hello guys, how are you doing? Good evening. Everything's good? Doing well. How about yourself, yeah. Professor? Good, good. The time flies. It's amazing that we're again in, in another Tuesday, in another class. Okay, guys, so um, let's give a couple of minutes and then we'll start, okay? Uh, well, let me set up my, my material here. Okay, so uh, let's finish the, the, the statistical part, guys. We need to start working on econometrics now, okay? So the, the last part of, the, of this part of summary of, of the statistics, guys, is, um, wait, wait a second, what do we have done? Have we done hypothesis testing already? Yeah, we started it. Oh, okay, so we started. So let me, let me finish this stuff because that's something that we always, we always do. Hypothesis testing. Okay, I, I think I, I talk already about the directional, non-directional hypothesis, correct? Yes. Uh, we have talked about the p-values already. The, the three, the, remember there are three types. Okay, so let's do a, a brief summary. Uh, when we have a non-directional test, Okay, so non-directional implies basically that I have, for example, mu equals mu zero. So this is a number. I believe that my mean is equal to a number versus mu is not equal to mu zero. We can solve hypotheses of this type in three, in three, in three ways. Now, number one, of course, hypothesis testing, the technique that we do. So basically here implies I need to, uh, if I know, if I'm using the C-test, okay? What I do is first my C-test is going to be my mean minus the value here over sigma over the square root of N. Okay, the first thing that you need to realize here, guys, is that we're making a huge assumption again. We're assuming that sigma is known, okay? So the population variance is known. This is a, a very, very strong assumption, okay? So the, the first step when we do hypothesis testing, and this is always going to be the same. We do first the C-test. Second, we do the, the graph. Well, you don't need to do the graph once you are familiar with this stuff, but this is called C-test because we're working on a normal, in a normal standard distribution, standard normal distribution. And then we simply, uh, in this part here, this is going to be my reject zone. So from here to here, I reject. From here to here, I reject. And this part here is no rejection. And this is my confidence level that can be 95% or can be whatever you can imagine, right? Your step three was simply to feel the, see where the, the C test falls. Remember? We're going to do a couple of exercises today with a different one. And then your step four, simply, Decide. So simply say, you know what? If I'm if my C test falls in the rejection zones, I simply reject. If it falls in non-rejection zone or fail to reject zone, so I simply fail to reject. Okay. Right? This was the number one. So that the second one, the second method that you can do for for hypothesis testing when you have a non-directional test is a confidence interval. Remember, and what we say here simply was that mu belong to x bar plus minus c sigma square root of n. And what was what was the decision here, guys? If the seat, if if the if the hypothesis value, if mu zero falls within the limits, 
then uh, fail to reject. Or basically, we normally say accept, guys, accept H0, but we don't accept H0. Technically, guys, we fail to reject because we don't have enough evidence to reject something. So that's why we say we fail to reject. Got it? So remember, guys, that confidence interval works if and only if we have non-directional tests. If we have directional tests, this method is not going to work. And of course, the, the method that we are going to use all the time is what we call the p-value. Okay, so what is the p-value, guys? It's simply the probability associated with the test. So this one here is my probability associated uh, with my C-test. In this case, with my C-test, but later it's going to be my T-test. Right? And the basic idea on the, on the, on the p-value, guys, is very simple. But, so let, let me graph this one here. So imagine that these are your critical values. Okay, so these are the, the rejection zones. Okay, so remember that probabilities are the regions inside the curve, okay, below the curve and the line. These are the, 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 the regions or areas. Now, if this is my C and this is my minus C, okay, if I have a test that falls, imagine, around here, okay, so this is my C test. So what is the probability associated with this e-test? Well, it is always to, it follows the direction of the c-test. So it's going to be basically this part here. And as soon as we have two, uh, two tails and it's symmetric, the normal distribution. So basically what we have is also this minus c-test here. And then what you do is you sum these two red sides. Okay, so your p-value simply is the sum of the two of two red zones. Do you agree with me? Guys, do you see that? Now, what do you think is the rule? If my p value, so remember this one here is going to be alpha over two, the, the black side is going to be alpha over two. So if I sum these two areas, I have alpha. What how this relation should be in order to reject A0? The p-value should be larger than alpha, smaller than alpha. Smaller than. Exactly. Must be smaller because it's smaller. You see that red area, guys? If you sum these two red pieces and then you compare with, a, with a, the black pieces, which one is larger? The black one, do you agree? So that's why the rate, if the rate is my p-value, if the p-value is smaller than alpha, then I reject H0. Correct? And this is going to be our rule of our golden rule, guys. We are going to be using all the time this one here. Why? Because it's very simple. You have a single number, you don't need to do anything. You, you just simply by knowing that the p-value is more than the alpha, you're going to be rejecting H0. If not, you don't reject H0. Make sense to everyone? So this is the logic of the p-value. I'm pretty sure you have done econometrics, so you always talk about, oh, and my p-value is more than 0 0.05, I reject my null hypothesis. Got it? So the intuition is that. Simply means that the probability associated with the test is smaller than the probability of the alphas. The alpha, not the probability. The alphas are probabilities already. Alpha, remember, guys, we call alpha the significance level. Okay, clear? When you have two, so you have directional tests. So basically either or Either or you have only methods, you can use only methods one and two. You cannot use confidence intervals when you have these type of things. Okay.
questions, guys. This is what we, I think we finished last, last class. So we need to do the last part of hypothesis testing and we, with that we are done, ready to talk about the, the, the first quiz and then we can move forward. Ready? Questions, guys, up, up to this point. No questions, it's clear? Perfect. So let's move into, into another one. Now guys, remember what we have done in hypothesis testing as confidence levels. What we said is that the first assumption for the C test is that I know sigma. The sigma is the population variance, okay? Or sorry, population standard deviation. But in, in real life, guys, it is very tricky that you know sigma. Because if you know sigma, normally you can know the, the population mean, and then you don't need to do anything. You know it, you don't need to do uh, inferential statistics or any type of analysis because you know it, right? So what happens, guys, is what, what when S, sorry, sigma is unknown, but of course, if I have data, guys, I can compute, I can compute the sample standard deviation, right? Yes or no? If I have 100 observations, can you compute the standard deviation? The sample standard deviation, yes or not? Yes. yes. Yeah, definitely. So just remember that your formula is going to be divided by x minus one. Uh, sorry, by n minus one instead of n, just to be consistent, uh, for consistency. Uh, sorry, unbiasedness, not consistency, unbiasedness. Make sense? So if we have this case, guys, the only thing that is going to change is that we are going to use something, my test is going to change, it's not going to be anymore my C test, it's going to be something that is called T test. And if you see the, the, the structure, guys, is going to be exactly the same as, a, as the previous formula, but instead of having sigma here, we have S, got it? And what is interesting, guys, why do you think it's called T test? because this one here is going to be distributed as a T, as a student T with N minus one degrees of freedom. Some of you remember what is the difference between the T and the normal? What is the difference between thicker the- Thicker tails. Exactly, who has thicker tails? The T. The T, and if I have imagined my degrees of freedom, my 1000, how is the T with a normal? They tend towards the same uh, shape. Yes, they're going to be almost the same. Remember that the smaller the, the, the degrees of freedom, the more different the normal distribution with the T distribution. But if we have um, a very large sample size, 1000, 500 or whatever, as, as we do in, in, in economics, by the way, the normal distribution looks exactly the same, well, almost exactly the same as the normal distribution. The T like, looks like the normal distribution, okay? So the T accounts more for small sample sizes. They controls better the, the, the tails. The tails are going to be fatter, fatter tails. And that's it, okay? So, okay, so let's do one example. And then you're gonna do this. Uh, let's do one example. What was my previous example, guys, that the date of my previous example, you remember? What was my, my mean? I think my mean was 85. 83. 83, perfect. Uh, what was my sample size? Uh, 100. 100, okay, so what I will do here is I, I will trick it. I will say my sample size is nine, just to make it the square root of this uh, a very, Simple number, okay? So I have X bar, so I have a sample of nine individuals. I ask them, what is your average inter uh, What is your average rate, uh, sorry, your average grade in econometrics during the last year, and the law is 83, the average is 83. So you have 10 individ uh, nine individuals, individual answers, and you compute the mean, okay? And then also you compute from this sample that the standard deviation equals, let's say two points. Got it? So it's very, it's, it's very focalized around 83, right? So now based on this 
on because remember what you try to do is you try to make inferences, guys. So you, you try to make okay. So with this sample, what can I say about the population? What is that the average grades with Professor Rahif on econometrics for all these fifteen years? Okay. So and I believe the average is going to be equal to eighty five. Let's say. Okay, so versus my null hypothesis that this is different than 85. Okay. So I want you to solve this example, guys, with uh, the three, the three uh, methods. Method one with uh, the hypothesis, step one, two, three, and four. Then the confidence intervals, you can, because you have an equality here. And finally, with a p-value. Okay, so you, you compute that. Okay, guys, before you, before you move, okay, before you move here, okay, copy one minute, and before you move, there is something that you know that I always ask this question, and let me tell you that at least only 10% of people that I have asked this question was able to answer, and it's something very simple. Okay, finish, and I will, I will tell you. Ready, guys? Before you start solving, guys, there is one, one question that I need to ask you. Okay? And, and this is based on the, on the previous class. Remember that using the t-test, normally the, the c-test, assumes that x bar follows what distribution? A normal distribution. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. But take a look here, guys. Have I mentioned to you something about the population? I have no idea. So you basically have no idea what is the what is the, the distribution of this one here. Do you agree? So can you argue with this data? And, and remember. N is very small. Can I immediately say that this is normally distributed with mu, sigma, square root of M? Can I argue this? No, because it probably doesn't follow a central limit theorem. Exactly, guys. Okay, so here what you need to be very careful is that you cannot assume this one because N is small. Then central limit theorem doesn't hold. Okay, so technically, guys, you should stop here. Make sense to you? You need to study. You need to remember, study, and then you want to realize that we have covered this part here. Do you understand that? Because n is very small, because it's only nine observations. The central limit theory doesn't hold. So basically, I cannot assume directly that uh, the distribution of x bar is normally distributed. It's normally distributed. Okay. Now, what I will add then here is I will tell you just in order to, to be able to solve this one here, I will also assume that X bar is normally distributed. This is an assumption. Got it? You know that you need to first test. So normally what you do guys, if you have this, this issue, well, increases the sample size, right? 
if it's possible. If it's not possible, guys, you need to look for literature review, just people that has used data like, like this data and try to come up with an idea. Is, is, can, I, can I argue that the, the probability distribution of this sample mean is normal? You need to find, you need to do more research, got it? But for this example, I'm assuming now that X bar, so this is my additional assumption, I need to do this assumption always, is normally distributed. Okay, given this knowledge, guys, now you can do it. Step uh, method one, two, and three. Let's say five minutes to do this. Remember, you're not going to use C tables, you're going to use T tables or, or Excel, no? It's T inverse, I think, C inverse. Yes, I think so. Uh, Leah, I, I, you need something more. The confidence level, let's just say at 90%. With this, you, you are able to solve it. Guys, can we change a little here just to just to get a different number? Can we change this one here just to make it uh, just to allow you to use the table? Let's use this one s equals one. I think this is going to be much better. Um, let me see. One second. One second. One second. Just I want more coherent numbers. So. Yeah, so no, sorry, let's do S equals three.
two more rhinos, guys, and then we solve it. Guys, solve it. You take a look to your notes and, and try to do it, OK? One minute, guys. Okay, answers. Do you reject, not reject? Reject. Reject the null hypothesis. Okay. So I have two James and who was a who answered? It was Taylor, it was you? Stefania? Alexa? Who said reject, guys? I, I need to identify you. Good, so? It wasn't me, but I also agree it's reject. Reject. OK, so let's take a look to what happens. OK, so let's do method one, OK? Remember the three methods must provide you the same answer. That there cannot be one same reject and no fail to reject. Always is going to be the same answer. Okay, so remember here we have a step. So my step one is to build my test. As soon as I know that I, I don't know the, the, the population, I normally I know this one here. So I use the t-test, correct? And this is the general case, guys. We're going to be using t-test all the time. So the t-test is going to be x bar 83 minus my hypothesis value 85 divided by uh, s equals three, the square root of nine, correct? So this equals minus two. Everyone agrees with me? Perfect. So my step two is going to be basically graph. 
I, I will exaggerate with the tails because the tails are going to be very different than normal. So they're going to be fatal tails. And I want this part to be 90%. So this implies that this part here that equals alpha over two is going to be 0 0.05. And, and this part here is going to be alpha over two equals 0 0.05. How do I find this one here? This is going to be a T, how many degrees of freedom? Eight. Eight, nine observations minus one is going to be a T eight, and this is going to be a minus T eight. So what do you get here? So let me show you my, my Excel. Where is Excel here? Excel. You see my Excel, guys? So this is my alpha over 2, 0 0.025. N is 9. And the, the, the command that I use is this one here. T inverse, B1 is alpha over 2. B2 minus 1 is 9 minus 1. Do you get this number? Yes. Minus 1.86, let's say. Everyone should be familiar to do this stuff very quickly in, in Excel, guys. So minus 1.86 is my, my critical value. So this one here is going to be 1.86. And this one here is going to be minus 0.186. Agree with me? OK, so your step three was what? Simply move your, your t-test and see where it falls. Well, minus two is going to be around here, correct? And basically then your step four is simply conclude. What do you conclude? As soon as we're in a reject zone, what we're going to do is we're going to reject H here. So basically what we're saying is that the population mean being equal to 85 at the 90% confidence level is rejected. Everyone understand method one? Yep. Okay, so let's do method two. So remember, method two is a confidence intervals. I can do that because I have a non-directional test here, SQL. So I can do that. So my formula is going to be mu belongs to x bar plus minus t, n minus one degrees of freedom, s square root of n. So we simply replace the values and you help me. This is going to be 83. One and you won. Sorry? Uh, that's fine. That's good? Yes. Yeah, 83 plus, I, I know already this value is going to be plus minus 186. That multiplies the three divided by a square root of nine. Correct? So mu belongs to what interval? Someone can give me lower. 81.14. 1, 1, perfect. And the top? 84.86. 86. Okay, so what is your hypothesis, guys? Uh, sorry, how do you use this hypothesis to see if we reject or not reject? We simply check my 85, this one here. And then we see that 85, so this one is my mu zero. Sorry, I will do lines everywhere. This one here, it does not fall in my confidence interval then reject H here. Everyone agrees with that. We are very close, guys. We are really, really very close. If we increase this to 95%, what is gonna happen? What do you think is gonna happen? What happens when we increase our confidence interval, our confidence level? The limits move to the extremes, do you agree? So, and, and as soon as you can take a look, 84.86 here. So if we move this number for, for something larger, 
most likely 85 is going to be in the interval. Make sense? Okay, so this is method two. So let's let's do method three. This is my p-value. Okay, so how do I do my p-value? I will do my graph. Okay, so I do the same. This part here, this part here, they represent alpha over two that is equal to 0 0.05 because I need this to be 90%. This is alpha over two, that is 0 0.05. How do I compute the p-value? I need to identify where the, the two falls. Okay, uh, sorry. This one is minus 1.86, and this one here is 1.86. And my, my t-test value is here, minus two. So what I need to compute is this probability, and then I multiply times two just to compute this probability here. Correct? So how do I find this one here? Okay, copy and then we do this together in Excel. Are you with me? Okay, so now how do we compute the, so let me show Excel again. So in order to find the p-value guys, what we need to register is simply minus two. So this is my, my t-test. The degrees of freedom, well, I can do nine is my, my how do you call it, my sample size. And then simply it's going to be minus two d minus one, that is my degrees of freedom, and one is cumulative. So I want this to go from minus infinite up to minus two. So I get 0 0.4026. Do you get this number? You can take a look to the formula. Yeah, it makes sense. So we obtain 0 0.0426. Now I go to my. So basically, my p value, guys. Is going to be two times. Remember, it's two times because we have a non directional test simply two times. 0 0.04026, that is equal to 0 0.08052, uh, something like that, right? Then what is your alpha? Alpha, guys? 0.1. Yes, 0 0.1. So you simply say p-value that is equal to 0 0.08, 0.052, this is smaller than 0 
Then what? What is the conclusion? Reject. Exactly. Reject H0. Um, professor, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Just to refresh my memory very quickly, I haven't done this in a while now, but why was p-value times two once you got it from Excel? And oh, what is, what because remember what we have here, if you want to compare with alpha over two, you need to multiply by two, but in general, all, all packages and all uh, R, eViews, Excel, et cetera, what they do is they co they want to provide you two times this one here, if you have a non-directional test. Okay, so why they do that is just to compare with alpha. Because if I don't multiply this by two, I need to compare this not with, uh, sorry. What is alpha here, guys? Do you agree that alpha equals 0 0.1? If the confidence level is 90%, one minus confidence level is alpha. Okay, when we have a two tail uh, test, we have alpha over two, alpha over two. So if you just want to use the, the one side of the equation of the graph, you need to compare you need, if you want to use this 0 0.04, you need to compare not with alpha, but with alpha, alpha over two. Make sense to you? So, but in general, guys, just as a standardization, standardization, what happens is that every econometric package or any statistic, statistic software, they multiply this by two in order, for, in order to allow you to compare with alpha, not alpha over two. And it is correct if you, if you simply do 0 0.04, but you need to compare with 0 0.05, not with 0 0.1, right? But don't get confused with that because you know what? In any statistical package that we're going to be working is always you compare with alpha, right? So that's why what our program is doing is simply computing this part here. And as soon as it's symmetric, we have this part here and we simply multiply times two. Make sense? Yep, thank you. Perfect. Okay, guys. One more and then we're done. You have questions? Let's continue with the same example, okay? What I will do is simply change something. Can I move? Yep. So now my null hypothesis, guys, is that I believe that this one here is smaller than 86 versus, of course, greater than 86. Okay, what methods you can use here, guys? Let's say now 95% confidence error. And all the data is as before. What uh, methods you can use? One or three only, correct? The confidence intervals, you cannot use it here. You cannot use them here. Okay, so go ahead. What do you tell me about this one here?
One more minute. Ready? Reject, not reject, what do you get? Would it be reject? Reject, okay, I have a rejection again. Someone else? One more minute and then we solve it. Someone else, if you can tell me what you're finding. Okay, so let's try to take a look to this stuff here. Okay, so let's do method one. Okay. Again, it's my t-test. The t-test doesn't change, the formula doesn't change. Uh, what was x bar, 85? 83. 83 minus 86 divided by three square root of nine, correct? So we have here minus three, right? Now I have, this is my step one. My step two is going to be, okay, I will, I will graph. Where is the, the, reject, the rejection zone? The right or left? Right. Right, so this part here, I want this to be 95%. So 
So this one here, guys, now is only alpha. It's not alpha over two because I have only one tail. So alpha is going to be equal to 0 0.05. And we know this, this value already is 1.86, I think. Right? Guys, correct? Yes. Everyone is with me? Do you understand that? We have only one tail because we have an hypothesis that is a, a directional one. Okay, so where is the rejection zone? Always the rejection zone. So imagine this one looks looks like an arrow, guys. Always follows the, the H1. So this more or less looks like an arrow like that. So basically your rejection zone is going to be to the right. Okay. Now, uh, the, the next step is step three, simply seeing where this number falls. This number falls in here. I was going to put it in to the right, but minus three, this is minus, right? Minus three is there, guys. I made a mistake. Yeah, it's 83 minus, uh, yep. Make sense or not? Professor, quick question. From yep. the, um, from the Excel formula we got above, when we do the T dot inverse, we got negative 1.86. How did Yes, you yes. Because remember, this is a, a symmetric distribution. So normally the T distribution, uh, sorry, the Excel goes from minus infinite up to the point that you're looking for. Okay, so indeed, the 5% the, the that computer is looking for is fine in this part here. Okay, I will draw this here and then I will delete this. So what Excel is doing is finding, you're giving 0 0.05 and Excel is going to this point here, minus 1.86, 1, 1. correct? This is what Excel is finding. But remember the beauty about having a symmetric distribution is that if you know that this is 1.86 and you know that this is 0 0.05, so what this value is here? 1.86. Exactly because the, the mean, the standardized is, is zero. Got it? That's a, that's a good question. Make sense to everyone? Professor, I just wanted to ask, why is the T-statistic not 2.306? In, in here? In, okay, uh, I have. No, just where the one point is 1.86, but... By, um, you see where you wrote 1.86? Yes, this one here or here? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I okay. calculated 2.306. In Excel? Okay, so let's take a look at Excel. Oh, yeah, I know what you have done. You have divided this by two, right? Okay, so let, let me show you what's going on here. Let's go here. Let's go here. So remember guys that here, you need to be very careful what you use. Are you using alpha? You're using alpha over two. So in this particular case, it was alpha over two, the first case when we have um, a non-directional non test. In this case, we have a directional test. Do you agree, guys? So let me copy all this part here. Perhaps all this part. Do you agree? So in this case, we have a directional test. So we need to provide Excel alpha. So in this case, alpha is 0 0.05, right? just by pure coincidence. My degrees of freedom, uh, sorry, my sample size is nine. I simply use this one here. Does it make sense? Okay, so what you have done, I imagine, is you divided this by, you divided this by, by two. But remember, in this case, you need to divide by two because you only have one side of the equation. Oh, okay, I Got see it? now. Yep. Makes sense to everyone. That, that's a very good question too, guys. Makes sense to you? No, Professor. Okay. I, I, I still got 2.306. Yes, well. because you have put 0 0.025, right? No, I put 0 0.05. I had the degrees of freedom as eight. Yeah. Oh, perhaps your, your version of Excel is different. Yeah, it can be different, guys. For you, per, uh, are you using the same command, t dot inverse? 
Are you using this Excel command? No, that's that explains it. I'm using T dot oh, two. inverse two. Two, yes, the two divides for you the, the, the alpha. So don't get, don't get confused with that. Simply use the T inverse, and then you know that if you if you have one tail, it's alpha. If you have two tails, it's alpha over two. Makes sense. So perhaps this one I can just to be sure. This is zero point one divided by two. Make sense. And, and the command, guys, is a, let's do the T inverse. Of course, Excel is trying to help us with T inverse too, but if you don't manage both of them better, don't get confused, just use T inverse. Ready? Make sense? Good so. Makes sense, thank you. Perfect. Okay, so now let's go here. Okay, so now we have my step three. It was simply my minus three when it falls. My step four is going to be what? What do I what do I conclude, guys? Do not reject null. Yeah, basically fail to reject H zero. So basically, guys, at ninety five percent confidence level. Uh, given these observations here, given this data here, I, I failed to reject. So indeed, the, the mean should be smaller than 86, okay? So let me do this one here. Method one, so let's do method two. The only, so I, I would call method three, that is basically the p-value. So for the p-value, how do I compute the p-value? So what I need to do is, okay, where is my critical value? Uh, is 1.86. And all this part here is my alpha equals 0 0.05, correct? What is my, my, my test is minus three. Okay. And what is my, my p-value? My p-value always follows the direction of alpha. So my p-value is going to be what region of my normal, normal distribution, to the left or to the right? right? To the right. If this is to the right, it's going to be. So you can see, guys, immediately how your p-value is going to be with respect to the, the alpha. We're going to find in, in a couple of minutes. So p-value. How is this p-value going to be with respect to alpha? Larger or smaller? Larger, a lot larger. Much larger. Just take a look to the red region versus the black region. Come on. It's much larger. So what is your, your conclusion? Okay, to reject. Correct? So now let's find the p-value using Excel. Are you there? Or just one minute to copy and then we go to Excel.
Ready? So let's take a look to how do we do this in Excel. I have my critical values minus three. Degree, degrees of, uh, sorry, sample size is nine. My formula is T dist uh, minus three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm finding here, what is this 0 0.00854? Do, do you get this one? Can I go back to my, to my paint, to my paint or to my whiteboard? So what is that idea? What is this 0 0.008 or something like that? What is that? It's a probability, right? But what, what probability, right or left? Right. Uh, to what? Left. left. To the left, guys, because remember, uh, any statistical package always goes to the minus infinity to, to a given number. So from here to here, the probability is going to be 0 0.08 0 .08 or 0 0.8, I don't remember. I got 0 0.8. 0 0.8, right? So this part here is 0 0.08. So this part here, from here to here, that is my p-value, equals what? It's a piece of cake, right? Should be 1 minus 0 0.08, correct? And this should be equal to 0 0.92. That is exactly my, my p-value. 0 0.92, of course, guys, is extremely larger compared to 0 0.05. And then you fail to reject. Professor, can you show in Excel again? Yes, of course. Here we go. So this is my minus three is my TS stat. Here was nine uh, sample observation, number of observations in my sample. So this is nine minus one is eight. One is cumulative and provides me that distribution from minus infinite up to minus three for a T with nine degrees of freedom, eight degrees of freedom. Uh, professor, I have a quick question. For, yeah, my, uh, for my Excel formula, for the T distribution formula, it only holds uh, three slots. And when I hover over it, it says it's for X degree of freedom and cumulative. Yes. Um, which of the values am I missing out for if you're able to put four uh, values? No, no, in? no, I only have uh, three values. This is one. Oh, oh minus one. All right, yeah, I see. And, Sorry. And this is another one. Yes, it's minus one. Okay, thank you. Pleasure. Make sense, guys? Oh, what I'm doing. Okay, good. So with this, we're done. So I, I think you have enough statistic. Uh, this was a very interesting statistical review for you guys. It's going to be extremely useful. If you really manage this part, and if you understand this part, and you are able to talk about this part here, so you're going to provide uh, the impression at least that you really understand the, the fundamentals of, of the statistics that is going to be the foundations for, for econometrics, got it? We're going to be using all these techniques, guys, from now on, and I will simply mention them, got it? And then you, you need to understand what we're doing, and, and you're going to be able to do that. Let's talk a little about the, the, the quiz. Do you have questions before I move? Hi, Professor. It's supposed yep. to be 0 0.08, and the oh. p-value is oh, 9. Oh, oh. This one. And is Oh, so it's going to, yeah, sorry. So this is equal to 0 0.99. 9902, something like that? Uh, 9914. Something like that. So 99, so 994. Thank you. Make sense to everyone? Okay, so let's talk a little about the, the quiz. Uh, this quiz number one, guys, is uh, purely what we have done in statistics. So it's intro to statistics. Okay, so what I need from you is to understand, for example, what is a concept of, uh, you know, contingency tables. You need to understand how this works. Yeah, well, before that, of course, descriptive statistics that I, I assume we all understand, right? 
And but what I'm interested in descriptive statistics is the concept of outliers. Okay, so how an outlier can simply shift dramatically your mean, can shift dramatically your standard deviation, right? Uh, and then understanding of common common metrics of uh, descriptive statistics. Then uh, when we talk about probabilities, I just I really need to I need you to understand contingency tables. Okay, and from contingency tables, guys, what you need to, I, I need you to understand is uh, probabilities. So let, let's do one very quick, quick example. Very, very quick and a toy example. So A, B, C, D, okay, three, two, one, five, six, four. Okay, right? so this I have five, five. Uh, I have five here, I have six, I have four, so in total I have 10, right? Right, so this can be, for example, female, this can be males, this can be accountant, and, and this can be economist, just randomly. Now, if you can see, guys, this table here is in terms of frequencies, correct? because they are numbers, okay? I have three females that are accountants. I have four males that are economists. I have in total 10 individuals. I have five females in my sample. I have four accountants in my sample. Are you following me? Okay, now, if you want to talk with probabilities, what you need to do is you, you, you don't work with frequencies, you work with relative frequencies. So how do I change that? So I have here, this is females is A, male is B, a accountant is C, and table, uh, sorry, and economists is D, okay? So if, what I do is simply transform everything into a probability respect to 10. So uh, into a ratio respect to 10. So this is going to be 0 0.3, 0 0.2, uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.4, if I sum 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and of course this one here equals one. Do you agree? Now, you need to understand the, the, the concepts here. So you need to understand what is the, how do we call the internal numbers? Remember? Well, I, 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 we don't have a lot of time, so I need to, to run. So I need you to understand what is a joint probability. So basically all the internal numbers are joint probabilities, or basically, for example, the probability of finding that randomly selecting a female that is an economist should be equal to what? What is the probability, guys? Oh, wait, wait a second. Before moving here, there is a crucial concept. Can I use this table as a, because they, it, this table satisfies the probability rules, you agree? Every single number is smaller than one and the sum of all these numbers equals one. So it looks like a probability. Can I argue that this is a, this represents probabilities? Can I argue that? Yes. Why? Um, because it is the uh, number of occurrences over the total number of things that happens. So, right? Yes, yes. But but remember, do you believe? Imagine, okay, I take ten individuals. Okay, can do you believe I can say that in general, the probability of finding a male that is an economist is forty percent in general? Do you, how do you feel uh, about that? No, that number is no. too small. Yes. What is small? Uh, the population or the population the size, size of the sample size, yeah. The sample size. The sample size is small. So that's why this, this doesn't look like probability. How do you feel confident that this, this can represent probabilities? For example, if I tell you this is in thousands, for example. You agree? 
So two or three doesn't represent three, it represents 3,000. Two represents 2,000, et cetera. Got it? So if you have, if your sample size is very, very, very large, the likelihood that this one here represents probability is much higher. How do we call this law? Props, yes, if and only if what? Of course, if and only if my sample size is very large. But this is called the law of large numbers. So you need to remember that law of large numbers is something crucial for me. You need to understand that. Okay, so now can you tell me what is the probability of finding randomly selecting one individual from, from a sample? What is the probability that this individual is going to be a female that is an economist? Assuming that this is a probability. So remember, joint probabilities, guys, appear where? Inside the table. So the probability A and D is simply the intersection between A and D. So it should be equal to 0 0.2. 0 0.2. Exactly. Then, I need you to understand the concept of marginal probabilities. Okay. So for example, what is the probability that randomly selected one individual, this individual is an accountant? Zero point four. Zero point four. So remember, marginal probabilities are all the numbers that are outside the box, outside the contingency table. And the last one that I'm interested in is something that is called the conditional probability. So remember the conditional probability in general, X on Y is the probability of the joint divided by the probability of the marginal. Okay, so this is in general. For example, what is the probability, guys, that given that you have selected a female, what is the probability that this female is an accountant? Do you understand? It's a sequence. First, I randomly select someone and I observe this someone. Oh, this someone is a female, perfect. So now, given that this is a female, what is the probability that this female is an accountant? So this should be equal to probability of A intersection C, divided by probability of A, correct? So probability of A intersection C, A intersection C is 0 0.3. Probability of A equals 0 0.5. Everyone agrees with me? Do you, do you follow me? So this is equal to 0 0.6. Do you agree? Professor, is the probability of being an accountant zero point? Oh, never mind. Never mind. Sorry. Do you agree? Uh, probability of being an accountant and female is zero point three. This number here. Okay, now what you need to know, guys, is mutually exclusive events. Another concept that you need to know. In all event, probabilities. So basically, this implies that something happens and the other thing cannot happen. Got it? And, and here goes the, the, the following formula. Do you remember this one here? What is the probability that I find a male, uh, sorry, a female, or an economist. So remember that we said that this one here is going to be equal to the marginals minus the probability of the of the joint. Remember we did this in um, with a Venn diagram. Okay, so in this case, P of A equals 0 0.5. 
P of D equals 0 0.6 and P of A intersection D equals 0 0.2. So at the end of the day equals 0 0.1, 0 0.9. Do you, do you understand what I'm doing guys? Now, so this is not mutually exclusive. So this is, these are not mutually exclusive events. A mutually exclusive event guys is one in which the intersection is empty. Um, the, intersect the intersection is empty. So this implies that when one happens, the other one cannot happen. Okay, so for example, what is the probability that we had at the same time C or D? Well, in, in real life, you can have an economist that is an accountant or an accountant that is an economist. But in this case, let's assume that they cannot, you are either economist or you're either an accountant. Okay? So these two processes are mutually exclusive because what happens is if I use the formula P of C plus P of D plus P of C intersection D. So P of C equals 0 0.4. P of D equals 0 0.6. And what is P of C intersection D? C is down, D is down. Do they intersect somewhere? No, plus nothing. So basically this is equal to one. Okay. So this is a mutual exclusive, mutual exclusive probability. Now, the last one guys that is crucial is a statistical independence. Okay, a statistical independence, guys, means the following, that the probability of something happening does not have an influence on the probability of another thing happening. Okay, so in general, guys, this implies the following. The probability of Y happening has nothing to do with the probability of X happening. So this implies, guys, that simply the formula, sorry, this is X, Y, This intersection here is simply equal to the product of marginals. Then if you simplify P of X given Y is simply equal to P of X. So this is something that you need to remember guys. It's simply the probability of, of Y happening has no influence on the probability of X happening. And then you can see here in this formula, we don't have Y, you see? This happens if and only if you have a statistically independent process. Make sense? Okay, so we have descriptive essays, we have contingency tables. If you understand all this part here, this is great. Uh, and then I think we have moved on, uh, hopefully I'm not forgetting anything, but you just review what we have done, okay? But just focus a lot of attention here. And then we have, of course, guys, uh, inferential statistics. Okay, uh, uh, hey, wait, 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 before this, before, before this, yeah, I, I need you to really understand uh, normal, the normal distribution versus the T distribution. Okay. So the, the crucial thing here is that remember that as, as N, so the sample size increases, the T distribution tends to be very similar to the normal distribution. Okay, remember that. So that's, that's what is crucial. If n is a small guys, okay, in that case, the normal distribution is going to be significantly different than the T distribution. But if the, if the sample size is large, you're indifferent between using one or the other. Okay. So then we go to inferential statistics.
Okay, and, and here what you must remember always is of course the, the following rule. If X is normally distributed mu sigma, X bar is what guys? X bar is what? If you know that the population is normal, what happens with the distribution of X bar? It's also normal. It's also normal by definition. You don't need to do anything. And the parameters are going to be mu sigma square, uh, sigma square root of n. So how do we call this one here? This one here is the standard deviation. How do we call this one here? Square root, uh, sorry, sigma over square root of n. How do we call it? Guys, we're going to be using this language all the time. So please learn. It's like learning a, a new language. You need to learn first the language of the, the names of the things. This is called a standard error. And in, in econometrics, guys, we always use the standard errors. Standard error, standard error. Why? Because we're using samples. Got it? So first case, if you know that X, the population is normally distributed, well, the, the sample size for sure is going to be uh, normally distributed. For sure, you don't need to do anything else. This is number one. However, the more realistic case, if X is distributed as whatever, I, I don't know what distribution has. It can have mu, sigma, and many other parameters here. What can I say about X bar? What is X bar? Can I assume this is normal? No. No, in general, guys, I have no clue. In general, I have no clue what, what this case is. Okay, however, even though X is unknown, the distribution of X is unknown, if and only if something happens, I can say that X is also normal mu sigma square root open. So what is the, the, the condition here? When can I say without, without knowing what is the distribution of the population that this one is normal? What is the condition in between here? And population right size needs to be bigger than 30 under decent. Um... Right, okay, well, you know what? I will say n larger guys. <laughs> yes, I, I remember the, the famous 30 number. But I, you know, I've done so many tests on this case here and never with 30, I was able to find normality. So the minimum I, I've been able to find normality guys is 250 observations. Let's assume large, okay? But indeed in, in academia, I remember when I was an undergrad, 30 was the magical number, okay? I don't know how, but by experience guys, it's not, it's not enough. But let's say N is large. So this implies that this can be not assumed to be normally distributed. How do we call this one here? Central limit zero. Exactly. So you need to be able to provide me all oh, central limit theorem. By central limit theorem, I, I am sure that even though I, I don't know the population distribution of X, I'm sure X bar is N. It's a normal distributed. Okay, and of course from here, well, perhaps that, uh, I forgot something here. Well, you also need to, to know guys how to compute probabilities. Okay, so remember, what is the probability of X larger than 30, et cetera? What is the probability of X between this and this? We have done a lot of exercises there guys. You need to know that. In, in this case, you need to know, for example, a, how, what is the probability of X bar larger than a given number? Let's say five, example. What is the probability of X bar being between six and seven, for example? Okay? Step one, step two, step three. You, you should be able to, to do this stuff. So. Make sense to everyone? Okay, we have done significant exercises here, so you should be able to replicate that. Now, uh, inferential statistics I have, this is number one. Of course, number two is confidence levels. Okay, 
Okay, so if sigma is known, you know that it's going to be mu belongs to x bar plus minus c uh, sigma square root of n. So you use the, the, the normal distribution because you know sigma. But the more general case, guys, is that you don't know sigma. But this implies that S is known, so the, the sample the standard deviation is known. And so instead of using the, the normal distribution, what you're going to use is the T distribution. How many degrees of freedom? Always n minus one, OK, at this point. S over square root of n. We have done also significant number of exercises, so it should be very easy for you. And it's not confidence there, it's confidence intervals. Confidence level is the one that determines the critical values, uh, confidence intervals. And finally, guys, hypothesis testing. Again, we have sigma known. So we are gonna, uh, we use the C test. That is simply X bar minus mu zero over sigma square root of N. And if sigma is not known, we use the T test. So this is distributed as a normal zero one. And the t-test, that is simply, the formula is the same. But instead of sigma, use s. And this one here is distributed as a t with n degree, n minus one degrees of freedom. That's what we have done now. sense? Okay, perfect. Uh, some, uh, some things, guys, uh, the, the test is online. So like we do here, it's going to last 30 minutes. And then we have 15 minutes to scan your document or take pictures. But please be sure, if you take pictures, guys, please be sure that all your documents come in a single document. So don't, don't give me 10 pictures, okay? So you take a picture, put them all together in a single document, got it? So your quiz uh, notations here, guys, please. Okay, so how, how the quiz is going to be. The quiz, please, the, the name of your test is going to be quiz Q1, sorry. This is the name of, name of your file. It's going to be Q1 underscore your surname. If you want a doc document, so you can write in the document that I will provide you, or you can do, if it's a PDF, dot PDF, okay, as, as you want. You can use Excel for the, the p-values, uh, for the p-values, for the critical values, etc. Make sense? But your Excel should be clear, guys, clean, just that, okay? You, nothing is, is empty. Now, the, the test is individual, guys, so, of course, I, I hope you have studied. You, of course, you can study in groups, you can work together. But during the test is the test for you. And, and remember guys, this is for you, it's not for me. I learned this because of you, because this is going to be extremely useful, not only for this class for you, but for your real life. Uh, the test duration is going to be 30 minutes, more or less plus 15 minutes uh, delivery. So you, you're gonna have, you go, you scan, you take pictures, and then you send this to me. Okay, as soon as you finish guys, please, you need to let me know. And uh, as soon as you let me know, I, I need to verify that I received your, 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 your exam. Once I tell you, okay, received, you can, you can leave. Got it? Make sense to everyone? Now, here comes the, the um, I think the, 
Yeah, I think. Yeah, so we have 45 minutes. So we're talking about 7, 15, 6, 30. We should start then the, the exam more or less at 6, 30. Okay, our time. More or less. Make sense? Okay, questions, guys. Uh, are you if so? If we use Excel to do like a lot of the computations, are you going to want a picture no, of our Excel no, sheet too, or no? No, 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 no. Yeah, well, no. If if you're using Excel normally, what I want from you guys is you need to do the. So I don't want you to enter, for example. Imagine this was my question, and you provide me zero point two. No, 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 no. What I need from you is I need to understand that you really understand. Is that you don't simply use Excel or whatever, and you put a number and you get a number. So for, for the probabilities, I want to see step number one, step number two, do my graph, do my critical values. You need to, to draw this in, in, your, in your assignment, okay? Got it, guys. So this exam, this test is, uh, I, I need to understand that you understand what you are doing. It's not simply entering numbers. I, I need to really understand that you understand what you're doing. Make sense? So this implies that you need to write in your, in your test. Now, please don't write a book. Okay. This is mathematics, guys. So the more clear we are, the, the, the less we write, the better. Okay, it doesn't mean that you don't follow the steps. Okay, but don't don't write, don't write, don't 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 dis, don't start writing and writing. Write. I, I don't know why sometimes some people write a lot in, in this studies. Is it reject, not reject? I, I don't want to give me a history of anything. Just simply tell me that. Got it. Uh, that's it. Questions. And now, Professor. Uh, yes, sir. Sorry, um, he said the quiz would be on Blackboard at the appropriate time, right? No, 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 no. We all uh, meet here. We all, uh, you know, everyone needs to be with the cameras on. Okay, so that day everyone's with cameras on, and then I simply give you the, I send you an email to everyone, and then we start all together. Okay. Make sense. Yep. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, what else, guys? Questions? Another question. So, what about the question type? Uh, so, like, uh, okay, what do you mean by question type? Like, you have a true or false? Like... Oh, no, no, forget about that. No. Okay. It's Just... going to be like this. It's going to be, I will give you, okay, guys, you know, I give you numbers, compute this probability. I give you uh, X bar, I need, I give you this, and I give you a confidence level. Okay, give me the, the confidence interval. Or what we have done, you know. Guys, don't overstress yourselves, really. That's why in the class it took me longer because we do exercises. And I'm sure that the, the answers of the exercises are correct. So what you do is you study, review, and then do by yourselves the, the exercises we have done. If you are able to solve them, you are more than, more than prepared for the exam, for the quiz. Okay, for sure, for sure, guys. Because that we have done in class everything that we need for, for this class. So if you just replay, uh, study and duplicate your, your examples, you're going to be more than well prepared, more than well prepared. Got it? Understand the logic, guys, the concepts, what I'm doing, so that this makes sense or not. That's what is crucial at this point, guys. Okay, questions? Hi, Professor, can we use yes. Excel to do the like t-test or the- Yes, you, no, you can use Excel. You know, you can use Excel, of course, as a computer, as a calculator, but please, if you write the numbers in your, in your in your exam so what i mean is that for example if you're doing if you're doing this i don't want i don't want you to write minus three directly i want you to write 83 minus 86 three divided by square root of nine do you see that i i want to see this one here make sense yes uh, also like do we need to type all the equation in the Computer. Yeah, but, but remember what, what you can do is, and this is what normally the, the students do is they simply, oh yeah, this is a good question because I, I have been experiencing this stuff, guys. So today is the, today, one year ago was my last class in person, guys. Exactly one, one year ago. It's, it's amazing. But okay, so what happens is the following. So indeed, indeed, what you can do is the easy thing is you are, you take your exam, print it. Okay, and then you solve it by hand the easy way, you solve it. Once you solve everything, you just go, scan, send it to me, scan or take a picture, just be sure that you have a single document, return to me, that's it. That's the easy thing. 
the other one, I had some students, guys, that didn't have a, a, a printer in the, in the dorms, for example. So for them, it was a pain. So what they did is very simple, guys. So imagine we have the, 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 the exam. OK, so I have one question, blah, blah, blah. Uh, two questions, blah, blah, blah. So what you do is you take a piece of paper, a white paper, and simply start writing. OK, one, and then you do your, your computations here. Then two, then you do your computation. And then you simply scan this part here. You can do that. So you don't need to print your, your document. Of course, it's cleaner for you also to, to have a better guide to print and, and write. But if you don't have a printer, don't, don't stress about that. You simply just take one. This is my answer. Two, this is my answer, etc. OK? Uh, of course, guys, this is a, a individual work. So I, I, I never stress this with my students. But according to the university, I need to stress this now more than before. Please. Be careful, not share any information. Don't, don't email in your friend. Uh, please be, be careful with that, OK? I, I, at the end of the day, guys, I really care about your learning. And you should care more than me about your learning. So no one is going to hire you because your friend learned from you or for you. Got it? So you, you're never going to tell, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my friend, Yachen was the one that, that answered my exam. Yeah. You're out. Got it? Life is like that, guys. So you need to be well prepared. If you want to work in teams, guys, you need to be extremely well prepared individually first. Right? Otherwise, you are going to be an obstacle for the team. Make sense? All this mentality of teamwork, teamwork, teamwork. Yeah, of course, teamwork, but every single individual must be extremely well prepared to contribute. Otherwise, you, the team is, is completely crazy and it's, it's not producing anything. Right? And the team now, guys, in the world is so competitive that if you get into a team and the team realizes that you're not working properly, you're going to be expelled, right? So that's why you need to learn this stuff. Learn this stuff that is crucial. And by experience, guys, what I'm teaching you is something that go to the, to the industry and the people is going to start asking about this stuff. Of course, if you go into any quant trading investment position in the industry, okay? Make sense? Okay, guys, so we stop here. We don't have time. Next week, we start final econometrics. Okay. Uh, and I speak with you after class very quickly. Yeah, definitely. Okay, guys, so we stop here for everyone, and then we just, I just stay here with the, the one that wants to talk with me. Okay, have a good night, guys, and see you next week. Take care. I, I okay. will try to, to get this, this one here uploaded very quickly, but but you know, I was talking with Fordham and Tora and Fordham, they are right. They told me I'm one of many, I don't know how many hundreds of classes. Okay, so but I will be trying to push hard to these guys to publish this one here too. Okay, guys, talk soon and have a good night. Take care. Thank you, Professor. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Good night, Professor. Good night, guys. Take care. Uh Professor, I have a sorry, quick question. 